exile. The state of being barred from one's own country, uprooted, evicted. The Jews were exiled, quite often actually. When we think of Jewish exile, we often think about the time the Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar sacked Jerusalem in the year 586 BC. But that's because the temple was destroyed then and books like Ezra and Nehemiah surround those events and even our text today in Psalm 137, it comes from that time period. But the truth is, there's so many more exiles. It's really a consistent theme throughout the Old Testament. And it starts with Adam and Eve. They were exiled from Eden in Genesis 3. They were barred from their home. Then in Genesis 12, Abraham's uprooted from his kin and his land, which just so happens to be how Israel's formation begins. It begins in exile. Jacob and Joseph both spend time in exile, and Moses literally lives the majority of his adult life in exile. Exiled from Egypt and then 40 years in the wilderness. I mean, take the first five books of the Bible, the Pentateuch. We also know it as the Torah. By the end of the major section of Scripture, Israel is anticipating its entry into the Promised Land. But they're still perched on the edge of the Jordan River in exile. The next major section of Scripture is known as the Deuteronomistic History. The books Deuteronomy, Joshua, Judges, Ruth, 1st and 2nd Samuel, 1st and 2nd Kings also ends in exile. There are three big exiles here. First, Israel's northern kingdom fell at the hands of the Assyrians. That happened in 720 B.C. These people were deported and scattered throughout the Assyrian Empire. Second, in 597 B.C., the political and religious elite of the southern kingdom of Judah including the prophet Ezekiel, were exiled by the Babylonians. And then third, in 586 B.C., the temple was burned by the Babylonians and everyone was forced to scatter to either Babylon or Egypt. So, six centuries before Christ, there were pockets of Jewish exiles living in both Egypt and throughout Mesopotamia. And they lived that way for roughly 70 years. So... Exile is a recurring theme, and it still is today. We have a worshiping community in our building every Sunday, the Korean Church. They escaped persecution in Myanmar or Burma. They also are exiled in the sense that they are barred from returning. Now, they could go back, but they're experiencing an exilic period now, a time of exile, a time of separation between their homeland and where they are. This summer, our youth went to serve families in safe houses across North Carolina. I mean, think about that. Families uprooted from their home environment and placed in a secret, sensitive, safe house to protect them. This is an exilic period. They're disordered from their natural order. For every one of us, we experience over and again the spiritual uprooting that life always seems to bring. Order leads to disorder, especially spiritually. Biblical exile is a physical displacement, but it can be a spiritual one too. And that's the part that speaks to us today. Exile is the most ultimate, full onslaught of disorder, a complete displacement. And that's what I want for you to hear this morning when we read Psalm 137. It was written while Israel was in what we know as Babylonian captivity. As you can imagine, it's not a good psalm, but it teaches us a tremendous amount about what happens when we're disordered. Now keep in mind, this is a cry of people attempting to find normalcy, and their entire lives are uprooted into chaos. Here we go. Verse 1. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down and there we wept when we remembered Zion. There's just not much more gut-wrenching lines in the Bible than this one. You feel the pain of the displaced Israelites wondering if they'll ever see their home again. I mean, think about what they must have felt. I mean, hear it again. By the rivers of Babylon, 
There we sat, and there we wept, when we remembered Zion. On the willows there we hung up our harps, for there our captors asked us for songs, and our tormentors asked for mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? It really is gut-wrenching. Their tormentors and captors force them to sing their songs of old, mocking their worship, so the Israelites bury their heads and cry. How could we sing the Lord's song in a foreign land? I feel this. They were broken, completely disordered, and they had no idea if it would get better. So they do what feels natural to us all. They turn their sadness into hate. They offer a scathing rebuke of it all, hoping to sway the God of their knowing to inflict pain and power on their enemies. Look at verse 5. If I forget you, O Jerusalem, let my right hand wither. Let my tongue cling to the roof of my mouth if I do not remember you. If I do not set Jerusalem above my highest joy, remember, O Lord, against the Edomites, the day of Jerusalem's fall, how they said, tear it down, tear it down, down to its foundations. O daughter Babylon, you devastator. Happy shall they be who pay you back what you have done to us. Happy shall they be who take your little ones and dash them against the rock. You didn't read or hear that wrong. They pray their enemies and their enemies' children get destroyed. And they want to revel in it. They want revenge. And we can all understand Israel's gut-wrenching emotion here. We've been there. So I don't think I've ever told you this story, but I want to tell you one of the worst things that's ever happened to me in my life. It was the darkest, possibly the darkest season of my life. I was a freshman in college. Now, some of you know, but I don't know if I've ever talked about this, but I played baseball when I was at Belmont University. One day in practice, I was at the plate. Pitcher threw a fastball high and in. I rolled my shoulder into the pitch, but the pitch kept rising. At the last second, I did the thing you absolutely should not do. I got scared, I jerked, and I lifted my head. As I turned to get out of the way, my head lifted just enough and exposed my left eye. The rising ball hit me square in the face. It was an out-of-body moment for a second. I remember seeing the ball on the ground and blood just dripping from my face. And then everything went dark. I fell to my knees and I passed out. It ended up just being a tiny little scratch right here. But just to be safe, I went to Vanderbilt Hospital for an x-ray. And sure enough, my orbital and zygomatic structure was fractured in multiple places. The doctor said I was going to need reconstructive surgery. And I remember asking, what happens if we just let it heal on its own? And I remember the doctor saying, well, your eye, it sits on your orbital. Your orbital is cracked in multiple places. The weight of your eye and on the shattered bone will eventually fall into your cheek. So I had the surgery. <laughs> I was out for the remainder of the season and obviously the year. I couldn't practice for months. Recovery was awful. I couldn't even carry things. I was completely disordered. I almost went blind, too. I have what optometrists call a pit, a half a millimeter from the center of my orbital. If the ball would have just a fraction of a millimeter to the left hit me in the face, I'd be completely blind in my left eye. But I'm not. Order. Disorder. Reorder. I'm fine now. The bone is strong enough and infused enough with titanium that I'm okay. But the left side of my face, my orbital, cheek, 
and knows it's all titanium. Order, disorder, reorder. And you have these moments too, these moments of real disorder, divorce, surgery, death of a loved one, getting laid off, seasons of depression or anxiety, changing majors or even schools, struggling financially, quitting a job, family problems, or just even personal concerns. There are millions of different things that exile us into the land of disorder. And if we're not careful, our brokenness can easily slip into anger, which can slip into hate. I went through all of that freshman year of college and I can feel even today the rage in me. I bet it felt a lot like what Israel feels. And this is the tale that you know your life is disordered. It's when you hate, when you create dualistic worldviews, when you resent and you want revenge and you rage. These are clear markers that something's wrong. You're disordered. You're consistently feeling and playing the role of either the victim or the victimizer. And actually both lead you into disorder. Which, to bring Jesus into this conversation, what is mesmerizes me about Jesus, it, it, more than anything really, is he never creates victims, nor does he ever play the role of victim. He was never emotionally or psychologically disordered. He was physically and socially displaced by his family, his friends. I mean, he was murdered by the people he thought loved him. But he never created nor claimed victimhood. He withstood the trap of falling into that lostness and hatefulness that comes with disorder. Now, this is not true for Israel. They are completely disordered. They were both the victim and then they prayed to be the victimizer. They were utterly disordered. And they have a lot to teach us today. When we move into disorder, we are not ourselves. We're altered. We're different. We're a shadow of our true nature. We're broken. Israel in Psalm 137 was broken. So what can we learn? from all of this here. I hope you see Psalm 137 as a cautionary tale and that you'll do your best not to fall into the trap of victimhood. And let's never become the victimizer either because that's what our disorder wants us to do. So how can you avoid it? Well, like we said last week, first, we need to realize that our disordering can have a purpose and a path for us. It's leading us out of something that is no more, and it can lead us into something new. But we have to first include in order to transcend. Now here's the second thing. We need to then give our pain to God. We need to see that God didn't put us in this disordering. Life did, but we can get through it together, and God is right here with us in the disordering to help. Don't turn away from God. Turn towards God. God walks through the valley of the shadow of death with us and even puts people and places into our lives to help. So don't blame God during this season or put God as the victimizer. God did not do this thing to you. Life did. Perhaps even you did. If anything, God is constantly trying to help. At least this is true for Israel. In the midst of their disorder, God sent prophets to help with their disorder and to reorder. But that's next week's sermon. Today in Psalm 137, in the midst of the Babylonian captivity, Israel is still very much suffering from disorder and it shows. You may be disordered now too, and that's okay. There's hope. Israel eventually comes out of it. If you let yourself process the grief that you're in, you will experience something better too. It will get better. It may not be till later, 
but you'll move from disorder to reorder when you include in order to transcend, and then you offer your pain to God. It is not easy, but it's the path we take if we want to move from disorder to reorder.